Hi, welcome to WebPixel Live. My name is Adam Hamlin. I'm the editor of WebPixel, and we'd like to thank Salaya Beach House for sponsoring this episode. Salaya Beach House are in Dumaguete in the Philippines. Fantastic black sand destination for macro and um, beautiful um, area. So please head on over to Salaya, that's S A L A Y A, beachhouses.com to check out um, the resource and what they offer. Um, I'm joined today by Alex Mustard. Hi, Alex. Hi, Adam. Nice to see you. We caught you, caught you slightly napping there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's, um, I was just um, checking. I just my phone was flashing. Oh, all right. Okay. And um, so we thought today we talked today. I thought we talked today a bit about um, big animals and how we go about photographing and approaching big animals safely, and obviously for them and us. Um, and and possibly a good place to start is 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 what would you define as a big animal, Alex? What are we talking about here? Oh, well, thanks for that one, because it, it's certainly, you know, the megafauna of the oceans um, are correctly designed by scientists. But the word big animal used by underwater photographers has no strict definition. But I, I think for, for ease of use today, I think we're best to talk about it as those larger, you know, charismatic um, species of, 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 of the underwater world that we maybe need to, to go away from our normal diving to encounter. Yeah, okay. So, you know, so, you know, I would say that, you know, a reef shark, you wouldn't say is a big animal because you see it on a reef. Yeah. However, a species that may be like a cetacean or a, a basking shark or a whale shark, or maybe a crocodile, those are in the big animal character category because they're not things we typically encounter while doing normal scuba diving. We have yeah. to go to specific places and operate in specific ways to have those encounters. So yep. those for me would be my my kind of big animal animals, and they're actually a very diverse group. And I think one of the points I definitely want to make in this is that there is no one size fits all in terms of your approach. Yep. Um, and the key advice to get straight into it is find good operators who run their operations with good naturalists who understand these animals and understand how you can have good encounters with them. Yeah. And if you follow their advice relating to that species in that location, you will have good photographic opportunities. And that's the key to it, really, yeah. is it's about realizing that however much diving you've done, you are not the expert now. You need to find the expert and follow their life advice to the letter, and then you will get the good pictures. And I think the thing I've learned doing big animal trips around the world is that you have to relearn each time. And yeah, what yeah, is yeah. interesting is how different it can be photographing one whale species to another. And I find that that absolutely fascinating. You know, I've got to talk about it now, really. But you know, for example, a, a you know humpback whales normally photograph those where, say, for example, there is a mother and a calf together in warm yeah. tropical waters. That's a, a normal humpback encounter that people have. They go to yeah. places where the whales gather to, to, to give birth. They've got mothers and calves together. The calves are fairly immobile. And so the mother and the calves are hanging around. The calves are often playful. Yeah. And the way you approach those is you stop the boat quite a distance away from them and slowly work your way towards them underwater so that you can have a nice encounter with them. Yeah. To contrast that, if you want to photograph the, the biggest whale in the world, the blue whale, most of the encounters with those are done with the classic crossing the T maneuver with a boat, which is used on a number of species, um, where you find the animals, you go parallel with the animal. So this is the animal, this is the boat. You overtake the animal, the boat then goes around and crosses the T, dropping the divers off or the snorkelers off in the path of the animal and then moves itself out of the way. And yep. then you hope that the animal then intersects your cross of the T. Um, and that's kind of the maneuver that is used with a, with a lot of those pieces. So a very different attitude. And with the blue whales, certainly in my experience of, with the blue whales, is you jump off basically a moving boat and you yep. go straight underwater because what the whales don't like is splashing at the surface. You drop down underwater and you hold your breath for as long as you can. And you hope that while you're underwater and you're holding your breath, that this whale swims into view and you get the chance to to that it will swim past you. But unlike a humpback whale, which is stationary or potentially even curious, a blue whale will just steam on past. Yeah. Um, sperm whales, on the other hand, we tend to encounter when they're sleeping or resting or, or you know rafting as pods. 
And there it's a case that you, again, stop at a, a, quite a distance from them and you don't swim towards them and you hope to and get them curious about you and they might come towards you. So very, very different with the different species. And I think anyone who, you know, what you find is people who've done one of them think all whales are the same. Yeah, and I think, yeah. you know, and, and it's the same across all of them. You know, you certainly don't approach a whale shark the same way you approach a crocodile. Yeah. Um, and I think people often tend to dump the, or lump the cetaceans all together. Um, and you know, so, yeah. Sorry. In, in general, I think uh, general advice is, is they're very sensitive to disturbance, and disturbance could be the splashing that you mentioned at the surface, and um, bubbles produce a disturbance that, in general, seems to upset them. Um, and and you often see this, you know, the, the, particularly at the beginning of the trip, you know, first the first encounter of the big animal, and and it was leaping off the back of the boat trying to get in the water, and that's probably the worst thing you can do. You know, th these really are the kind of encounters where yes, okay, it can be quite kind of fast and furious getting into the right place but then once you're in the right place you slip into the water and slip underwater as 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 quietly and as stealthily as you can because they are very very aware of those types of disturbance those are a classic kind of you know that that will 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 tend to drive the species away from you um and and you know they'll turn away when they notice that kind of disturbance and that that's a mistake that a lot of people make i think i think swimming towards animals as well as a huge you know on the surface particularly you know and and, and swimming vigorously towards them you know that they're, they they're not going to tolerate that they, they're going to turn away generally they're going to turn and move away so and i think if you've done some wildlife photography above water where wildlife is much more cautious you tend to have a bit more of a better feel for it you know if you want mm. to photograph a, a deer in a field you don't go through the gate of the field and walk straight to the deer and expect the deer to sit there and wait for you you know you take your time you 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 work your way you know you use your 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 field craft your sense for that animal to keep mm. that animal relaxed and allow mm. you to close the distance down so that you mm. can get your photos and i think a similar approach is important here you know the, the most important thing though is always to understand clearly from the local naturalists the best way to have this encounter they will tell you the things that are going to upset the animal and the things yeah. that they won't be so bothered about and yeah. i think when you understand those things i think it may, makes a really big difference um to backtrack a little i would say that one thing that unites a lot of the big animals is that these are encounters that are made with free diving it's yeah. not all the time um you know I, i've um you know things like gray whales and I've even photographed things like false killer whales. I've actually photographed those without going in the water at all and just hanging over the side of the boat. But, it, you know, I haven't photographed great whale, gray whales, but gray whale photography is typically done with just, you know, just your hand in the water. Um, yeah. And I've photographed other cetaceans that way as well. And it can be a really great way to, to photograph those things. It's a slightly less experience, but you still get that experience of being so close to these animals around. And, you know, I remember with the false killer whales, we were in a tiny fiberglass boat and the sound of their whistles just came straight through the hull. So, wow. you know, you had as much of an oral experience as being in the water, and you could see them incredibly well over Very the cool. side of the boat. Um, but anyway. Where was, um, that? Where, where, where was that, Alex? Sorry. I'll try and not to. Where was that? Um, that was in the Indian Ocean. Um, wow. But they're quite common. They're quite common across the Indo-Pacific. I've seen them in Palau. I've seen, seen them there as well. Um, and, yeah, but just, just, yeah, and what we found is we went in the water with them a few times, and we got decent encounters, but we noticed that when we weren't in the water, they were coming closer to the boat. So we decided after a few jumps, um, spoke to the naturalist guide, and they said, well, you're going to see them if you go in the water, but you might get better pictures if you stay on the boat. And so we decided to do a few passes, doing that same crossing the T maneuver, going alongside them, going ahead, stopping the boat. And mm. it was kind of not a complete T, kind of a half T, um, yeah, yeah. stopping the boat, turning the engines off and then waiting for them to come towards us. And they were curious about the boat with the engine off, just bobbing there in the water. And yeah, we got really nice encounters. Uh, mm. And they came and we got much better photos without going in the water. Yep. Um, but yeah, that's the rule is it's, you know, is you've got to follow that local advice and treat every species differently. And also appreciate that the individual species within them, you will have individuals that for that day, that moment are curious, it may be the way they feel. It may be the way you've made them feel by the way you have behaved. Yep. And then there'll be days when that same species just isn't in the mood and you have to learn to say that animal's not in the mood. We're better yep. to go and look for another individual. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think that's a big part of it as well. 
So I I, uh, I chat a lot with Tony Wu. Uh, Tony mm. has done a lot of station for photography, particularly. Yeah, um, I mean, you know, better than almost any you know than, than anyone who's ever lived, I would think. And and, and one of the things that Tony does, and this is, I mean, we all need going to set is is that Tony spends a lot of time working out, <laughs> um, primarily to increase his breath hold times, because he's found that in order to get photographs, particularly of humpbacks, but a lot of the species that he photographs, it's all done on, on breath hold, as you mentioned earlier, all done free diving. Um, and he simply has found that in order to get those pictures, you know, being able to spend that extra you know, 10, 20 seconds underwater holding his breath has paid dividends photographically. And he, he literally, you know, um, he, he spends his life either working out or taking pictures of whales. So, <laughs> um, so you know, and that, that I think is, an, is a, you know, a, Obviously, for a dedication to the subject, but that that again, it may be worth if you're planning. Did, a, I remember Tony actually. He posted this amazingly funny um, montage of him. It was like a montage from an '80s movie with him yeah. working out to uh, to music. That was really a uh, training yeah. for his next whale trip. Yeah, I think there was also one that did the rounds of him being sick in between his reps. <laughs> he was yeah. pushing himself that hard. So it's not necessary to be quite as obsessive as that. But but certainly... But if um, you are yeah. going to be, make sure you record yourself so we can all yeah, enjoy that's it. That's right. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll feature it on Wet Pixel Live. Um, but, but, um, your point is really important, is that a lot of these big animal encounters are done freediving and having good freediving skills you don't need to be a world record holder but getting the most out of yourself as a freediver is really important so a little bit of training a little bit of understanding about freediving and a little bit of the right equipment that can make a really big difference mm. um you know for example a pair of, of freediving fins can be a really good addition you don't necessarily need to have a freediving suit because often a lot of these are warmer water adventures that people go on so actually mm. you're actually going to be more comfortable during the day in just a skin or something like that nice dive skin but good free diving fins can work really well from my own experience the coolest looking free diving fins are the super stiff um carbon fiber ones the best ones as a photographer are not those hardcore ones if yeah. you're as fit as tony probably you can use the really hardcore ones because you're really trained and used to doing them if you dip in and out of this type of photography you're much better with softer free diving fins, which are actually also designed to work better at the surface as well. If you okay. go through a catalog of, of free diving fins, you'll see ones going, these are you know, super stiff, really good for deep diving. These ones yeah. are designed for you to spend a day in the water at the surface, yeah. where you're swimming a lot at the surface and occasionally diving down. Those softer fins generally, I think, fit much better. Um, it hurts me to say so, but generally spear fishing fins, um, which are designed for diving down and chasing fish around underwater, are actually a much better option than than pure free diving fins. I mean, yeah. Free divers, when they're going for records, actually don't fin very much. You know, they do two or three powerful kicks, and then they just let the let the, their buoyancy carry them down. They stop yeah. finning, um, and that that and makes they're them the ones that, using the cool carbon blades. Yeah, and actually, it's us guys, and it's I would say like with with the free diving fins I own, they've all been pretty much the the least flashy one in the range because yeah. yeah. they're actually the everyday one um and they're they're the best for this so, yeah 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 how, how about camera gear Alex? what what sort of what sort of things should we consider in terms of camera gear for 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 shooting big animals possibly so um most of the time it's obviously a wide angle photography exercise and yep. i would say a lot of big animal photography is done without flash is you know yep. is it very much a generalization um, often that's because these are large animals that are too big to light with flash. They're often yeah. not particularly colorful and there's no need to light with flash. We're encountering them near the surface where, again, there's no need for flash. And also there may be situations where flash is also not allowed or not advised by the naturalist with those species anyway. So there's lots of reasons not to use flash. If you want to be maneuverable in the water, the bigger your rig, the harder it is to push through the water. Yeah. Now, you may really want to have a GoPro on there. You know, and, and, and OK, that is something that is probably is quite nice to have for this type of encounter. But you want to think carefully about how big a dome port you really want to take on these trips. If mm. there's anything that you can pare down on your housing just to make it a little bit more slippery through the water. I do all my big animal photography with the Nikonos RS 13 mil lens because it's just got such a lovely small footprint. Yeah. And, you know, anything you can do to make the housing a little bit smaller, um, yeah. I think can make make these things work really well. Um yeah. I think when shooting on these dives, it's available light shooting. Um, some people like to use, you know, an aperture priority mode. 
I'm very happy shooting this on manual. Um, although if it's a day where it's sunny, cloudy, sunny, cloudy, then I'd potentially go go over to aperture priority because you can be in the middle of a dive on free dive dive and it suddenly goes cloudy and then it's sunny and your exposures are jumping around. But if it's reliably consistent weather, I like manual, it just stays the same. And actually it means that if you shoot with the light, it's all bright and if you shoot against the light, you get a good exposure that's nice and moody. The light yeah. varies relatively little and you can set it up. At the, you know, you've done your dive, you've had your pass. If you think your exposure isn't quite right, you could do some nice shots of your buddy swimming near the surface, get yeah. some shots, get it dialed in. If you can't see the screen, either wait till you're back on the boat, put a towel over your head and look at your exposures properly. Or when you're in the water, just before you get back on the boat, swim under the boat into the shadow of the boat and look yeah. at that screen properly, make sure exposure is right. But it doesn't vary a lot if the weather's consistent. You're yeah. in the open blue, diving in the same weather, it stays pretty consistent. So technically, I think it's a very easy type of photography. Yep. Um, you might have the opportunity to use the light in certain ways in the way that you dive. If you have a choice with an animal, if you swim yep. towards the sun when you're you know, trying to get the encounter, then you've got more chance that the animal will pass on the other side of you and therefore have the light on it. But yep. generally, I would say if you've got multiple encounters during the day, Take what you get, and you'll have some shots with the sun, some shots without against the sun, but both will be nice in your portfolio. Um, but yeah, uh, um, and then the only other thing is how many shots to take. Yeah. I personally like shooting continuous, but on quite a low frame rate of yeah. maybe just two to three shots per second. Yeah. I know other photographers argue you might as well shoot 20 per second if you can have it and just edit them afterwards because maybe there's some small things. I have very, very rarely felt that I missed something because I, I was agree. doing that. And I actually like to be able to see a little bit more through the viewfinder than to have constantly the, the, yeah, yeah. the viewfinder closed because the camera's taking, you know, it's yeah. maximum number of frames per second. But I can see the argument of people saying, well, actually, I'd rather have a thousand pictures at the end of the day rather than 250 to sort through. It, it's, it's only disk space. It's only time to delete um and i can understand that argument but i personally prefer a lower frame rate how about you adam no i'm saying I, I work at work and do a slow which i think is normally about three frames a second and and that, that's fast enough you know i we're not again the thing about big animals is they're actually not moving that quickly you know there's not so so you know there's not, not a big great change good. between the frames not, no there's not you look at three frames a second and it's not and i, I don't really see a need to go any they're faster. almost the same anyway aren't they if you shoot yeah. faster than that yes you can shoot more but the shots are all basically the same. Another piece of advice that, that and this is very um, brand and, and, and camera model specific, but if you have the option of a camera that does a good job of shooting in live view, consider using it. It's quite a good tool for this um, type of shooting. And um, Unfortunately, I'm a Nikon user, so I, I, I don't really use it, but certainly other camera brands do a much better job in live view and obviously some of the mirrorless cameras too, um, you know, where you're just shooting on the LCD screen and having that nice big LCD screen while, you, while you're swimming about, you know, holding your breath, I think works really well. So if you have the option of using it, certainly consider using it. It's not, it's not a bad idea. Yeah. I, I, I certainly also agree that the smaller the camera, the, the easier things are. I mean, the, the photo of mine from Isla Mujeres that was awarded in the wildlife photographer. Mm. The reason that shot, did so well is that all the details are perfect it's not a particularly original idea it's not particularly original opportunity but mm. the detail of it is absolutely right and mm. that detail was right because i was able to get into exactly the right position relative mm. to the whale shark and i was able to do that because i didn't have a massive great camera it was shot with a small olympus omd m5 and that smaller camera with a small housing was so maneuverable that i could actually get that exactly right position and that made a really big difference. Yeah, um, yeah. So the final thing I wanted to talk about, maybe I've forgotten something, is that in a lot of these places, um, you need um, licenses and permits to be in the water with certain species. Yeah. And it varies a, a lot. So it's, you know, it's, but it's important that you have those. If you, first of all, the correct operators will be working within those systems. And if they've been licensed, you've got a good chance that you're choosing a good one. 
I would spend time also speaking to other people who've been to those destinations and find out about the about the um, the good operators. Um, but you need those licenses because without them, you can't use your photos. And also, you know, it, you know, it's showing that you weren't operating in the agreed way with those species, with the agreed operators. And as a result, I think you're, you know, it, it's not the way to go about things. So, um, you know, I, 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 you know, you have photographic licenses, everything from, I've, you know, got them for everything from photographing salmon, seahorses, yeah. um, manatees. But with the big animals, it's more common thing that you have to fill in these forms. Sometimes they require some money. Sometimes they require lots of money. Often they're just a bit of paperwork. Um, but it's important to follow follow those systems. Um, if we support those license processes, um, it means that there's a regulation on this type of activity and that animals are not being unduly stressed because too many people are doing it in too short a time. Too many operators are competing to try and get guests on the same subjects. And that is often a big cause of the stress. Yeah. It's, you know, you give one photographer an opportunity with a subject, they'll behave very well. If they know they've got to swim faster than that guy and run their boat faster than that guy and get closer to the animal than that guy, that's yeah. when the, the animals start getting stressed. So Absolutely. it's why the licensing systems are very valuable because they, they control the level a, of, of people at a manageable level for the opportunities and the species. And your best source, and you alluded to it, Alex, is your best sort of information on manage on, on, on licensing and the requirements is to, to consult local operators and make sure, you know, speak to other people, but speak as well to the operators. In general, most registered operators are going to operate within whatever management systems are in place. So, mm. um, but it is really important. Yeah. And, you know, I think, I think, you know, if you were planning a, a specific trip somewhere, it's worth, it's worth researching what's required to do it. It's, um, it's really important. Yeah. That's wonderful, Alex. Thank you very much. Lots of great information. Um, I'm, I just I'm want to go and do it now. <laughs> yeah, I, was, I mean, that was sitting here. Um, it, it's, um, of course, it's well shot time in, in uh, Mexico at the moment. And um, we much chance of us being there, so, which is very sad. Anyway, um, Alex, um, I guess they can probably search amuster.com for whales. Do, would you tag it whale? Yeah, I'm not, I've not done a lot of cetacean photography. I've always tried to learn a lot while I've done it. So there are plenty of people who've done a lot more than me who who who, are, who know a lot less, if you know what I mean, in terms of yeah, how these yeah, things yeah. work around the world. Um, yeah. But, yeah, yeah, um, I, I would say, yeah, or, or look on Instagram. I share the big animal shots quite a bit. I know for, for Earth Day I shared some whales and whale shark pictures on Instagram. Alex Mustard one. Good place yeah. to follow me. Great. Okay. Thank you very much, Alex. Um, and once again, we'd like to thank our sponsor for this episode, Sly Beach Houses. Thank you very much for your support. I'd like to thank you all for watching. Please feel free to add any comments or to ring the bell to get notified when we produce episodes in future. And to drop us a like if you enjoyed it. Thank you very much. I look forward to seeing you soon.